Warning. 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 Now for a word of caution. The information you are about to hear is the exact knowledge they don't want you to know and may not be what you're expecting. Some listeners may experience discomfort and difficulty digesting the following content. Others may experience dramatic improvement in mood, mindset, and overall sense of inner self. Now, it's time to turn it up and tune in with us as we dive deep into the difficult topics and discussions that we've all been avoiding, made available for wow. all whoa, whoa, to whoa. hear. Hold on a second. So, <laughs> I, I'm, already, I'm already feeling a little discomfort. <laughs> that was different. You don't like it? Is that the intro we're going with? That's it. I kind of... I kind of like it, actually. I was hoping it's kind of a joke, but it's serious. Everything they're saying in there, I kind of feel. Uh, uh, I feel. I don't feel anxiety. I feel good. Do you feel improved mood? I do feel an improved mood. Which mood are you in? Let's st- let's do it. <laughs> let's go with that. Let's start this, man. All right. Well, why not? What other better place than right there? That's right. Everyone, welcome to the Bridge Podcast. I'm Travis Haley, the host, and today. I've got Jared Seagraves with me today. Jared's our director of training here at our training company at Haley Strategic. And uh, I've got Jared here on our very first podcast because I figure him and I, you know, we go out in the world and we see um, a lot as well as our, our whole other training team. And we get to see a lot of cool stuff. We get to meet a lot of interesting people. Uh, we get to We get to really find requirements not just for training and product development, but for life in general. And I think that's some of the things that I wanted to talk about today and kind of explain what this podcast is, where it's going, uh, maybe even the frequency, you know, we can talk about that. Uh, but but why? I think that's the biggest question that people have asked because, you know, lately people are like, well, hey, you're coming out with a podcast. What are you guys going to be talking about? Guns and gear? I'm like, mm, sorry. So if you are subscribing for that, um, I think like when people come to our class to to go to a shooting class, when people ask them at the end, hey, how was the shooting? They they typically say it was also a shooting class. That's the last part of their reflection. Right. And I think that's something I want to talk about more because like in a class, if you think about what we do, um, we use a lot of science. You know, Jared's a scientist in his own right. We go into some of that stuff. But what are some of the things that we do in a class? Well, from a shooting aspect, we measure we use science to measure everything, measure your performance, measure how fast you draw and deliver one shot. We quantify everything. But the one thing that we cannot quantify human is the spirit. human spirit. Yeah. Is the people. Well, I think that's like all the things that we do, right? The, the, uh, the drills, the exercises, the processes, the scientific formulas, the sports performance, psychology, everything that we put into the courses, that's all measurable things, right? We can get a lot of objective um, answers out of that because of the way we test things and create baselines and, and all that. But the most important <clears throat> the most important thing in that entire environment is not quantifiable. It's not. And again, that's what we've come to realize the hard way after many years of going, why, why do people have this kind of feedback? in our courses um, and what we do as a company here. And um, and again, this isn't us tooting our own horn, it's us describing and explaining the reasons why we do things that we do. Um, and that's what this podcast is for, is to share information. I believe that the world is a forum. You'll hear me say that a lot. Um, and I don't feel that we, we share enough. Um, and if we do share, are, are we sharing authentically? Are we being, you know, through, through gratitude, through appreciation? Um, not just like a lot of people in our world will come in and say, all right, guys, here's who I am. Here's what I've done all my life. Here's my two cents. Now you better keep up. And this is all that matters. And that's all that matters is what I'm going to teach you in the next few days or week or whatever it is. I think that's ludicrous. I think that's toxic. I think that's somebody that's living in a world that is, um, extremely unauthentic and counterfeit and has this, um, illusion and separation between who they are. And so I think that's some of the things that I want to talk about, like what makes a true, what makes a true warrior, right? Um, a lot of the principles that we'll typically talk about, which you'll hear a lot. Like, so when people come onto our podcast, um, like you'll have different trainers that we're going to have sitting here. You're going to have um, different personalities from around the world, not just our own industry. But um, like, I think Amber is coming next um, from Naked and Afraid. She's been like the winner 50 times in a row, I guess, you know, it sounds like, uh, but like, I want to know why, why, why would you want to go out there and put yourself in that type of situation, which I've done, 
But honestly, I thought about it. She she just got done doing a 60-day challenge down in Peru. 60 days, naked and afraid in Peru. And she's already won, I think, two other 20s and 140. So she's, I think this is their third or fourth big win. Like 60 days naked and afraid in a survival situation. Why would somebody want to do that, right? Um, so those are the questions that we ask people. Is like, why would you want to put yourself through that? And what in your life made you select that path? Um, a lot of times it isn't some, well, I went to this performance school and I was taught this and taught that. It's like, no, it's, you'll hear these innate answers, like this intention, this drive, this motive, this um, <clears throat> conation as we talk about your instinctual strengths come out. Well, that's, that's where we start. In all classes, we don't start with it, nothing. Our starting point has nothing to do with a gun. Well, I think that's the best thing to do is talk about how. So how do we start a course? We start a course with introduction with people telling us about themselves and at first, it seems a little superficial. Yeah, I'm Jared. I'm from Texas. Here's mm-hmm. my experience. And then we get to what is your intention? And the root of that is why are you here? And a lot of times people don't know, especially if it's you know the first few people that go because they're, they're put on the spot. No other training that I've ever been to prior to Haley Strategic facilitated that. No training ever made someone stand up and tell the, the group, there may be 24 other people that they've never seen in their lives, but they have to share something and be vulnerable. And that's hard for people to do. But well, it's because I, the people confuse the definition of vulnerability with weakness. Did you ever have to do that in your career? In any training school that you ever went to? <clears throat> in, in any school that you went to? Well, first of all, what was your intention of going to a school in your military career? Yeah, well, it's to um, to beat my best, right, from yesterday. If I didn't know something, I'm going to this basic school, for example, like free fall school is a, a, a big one for special operations guys. It is a basic course, even though people look at it like it's extremely complex. Well, it's complex. You're jumping out of an airplane, you know. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted to go there and come out knowing something that I didn't know going into it. Right. I wanted to, to, to be smarter than what I was 30 days previous to that, that enrollment. Um, Did they ask who you were? Never. <clears throat> Your name was on a locker. Actually, it was a, I think it was a number. You, know, you typically put a number. Like military is like that. So guys out there in the Army and stuff, airborne school, stick a number on your helmet. That's all you are is a right. number, right? Because some of those schools, attrition is the mission, right? We need to weed out all on hackers who don't pack the gear to serve in this beloved core kind of concept. But um, even in some of the most formal gentleman-type schools, like really laid back, very, you know, teaching-oriented, not yelling and telling, because when you tell somebody something, they forget. When you teach them, they learn. Uh, even in those types of environments that I had great instructors, great mentors, they still never forced me to get up and ask questions. They never said, it's okay to ask why. It was actually opposite of that. They assumed why you were there. <clears throat> of course. They assumed why you were there. You were there to check the box, to have that stepping stone towards a greater goal. So they assumed why you were there. I think they assumed that I was there to do something for them to be another component to the team, to the element, uh, versus them saying, why are you here? And do we really want you here? That's a, that's a good part of that. That's, that's a time to ask people. Um, because I think we've had people in our classes like, wait, I, I didn't realize that this was, was going to be like this. So I need to have a come to Jesus meeting on the side, man, you know? Um, but I think the how concept does something um, like how we do things, whether we're public speaking, whether we're building products, whether we are teaching in a course, we're, we're building those bridges, right? And that's why we call this the bridge podcast because we're spanning to different areas in the world. Um, for example, I went to culinary school to learn how to shoot better. You know, people laugh when they hear that. I went to bar dancing to lessons in schools to learn how to move more fluid, you know, and, and move more uh, mechanically efficient. Well, what do we do when we're moving and shooting with a gun? If I gave a ballerina or a ballroom dancers guns and taught them how to shoot on the move, they would smoke check out all of us. Fact, right? That is objective truth because when you measure how fast they move and how stable they are and how fast they can think on their feet, that's the skills that I want. I want to put that into my world. So that's why we always tend up saying to people, stop stuffing shooting into your life. You get that little box of ammo and you got to run to the range. Instead of doing that, 
take your life and put it into your shooting and watch what happens. Um, and that, that is the bridging effect is what I mean. So we're, you'll, you'll see that with a lot of different professionals and people that we bring onto the show and asking them questions like, what, what, why, why did you take this particular route? And what, what we notice out there is a lot of us, and I think coming back to the introductions of the class, when you have 25, 26, 27, whatever students we have do an introduction, which takes how long? Mm, sometimes up to two hours, hour and a half, two hours. A lot of people during that time go, why are we, why are we not shooting right now? What the hell is going on? Why are we talking about our feelings? And it's not, it's people telling their life stories in that short amount of time. And that is really a short amount of time to get to know somebody. But what happens after that two hour session? People have relevance. It builds immediate relevance. When they look around the room, they see themselves and other people, or they see connections that are made and it checks the ego at that point. We see it all the time where, you know, people walk into that environment and they're measuring mm -hmm. everybody that walks in just like they would do out on the range and checking everybody's gear and just sizing everybody up. Well, when we start by introducing yourself to everyone and, and the process really starts growing, even between the, the first person and the, the fifth or sixth person, the process grows, it gets deeper. And you see people's, you see people digging deep and you start to see the why where maybe early on people didn't know the why. And we've had people, we may give you an example here in a few minutes, but we've had people come back on day two and part of their reflections and say, I have, I have looked deeper into my why and I've learned something about myself, but that whole process connects that room. And it just changes the entire learning environment because that's really why everyone's there. You know, I ask what, what your intent was when you went to a, a school in your military career. You wanted to learn. You're a very driven, ambitious individual. You wanted to be the best at everything you could possibly be. When we set out with a purpose of learning, we hope to be, our goal is to be different when we come out the other side, to not ever be able to go back to where we were. That's the ultimate goal. And when you build connections between people in that environment, it facilitates that. It can be, it can be the catalyst. If you guys are familiar with that term, the catalyst is something that speeds up a transformation. And that's, that's our why. And then all of the steps we take in the how facilitate that why facilitate that common goal it's just transformation we want people through learning and insight and questioning to be different after three days after es after every single day and that intro seems to really help people make connections with one another well i think <clears throat> i think a lot of people um Typically, we'll sign up for a course like this in our in our communities, or you know, offered from our industry um, to really come and put in the reps to shoot, you know, to talk about the guns, talk about the gear, and you know, the, I think the the theme or what I want people to terminally take away from that course is that it's also about shooting. It's also about shooting, right? It's it's about like my kids the other day. You know, we were. We were talking about shooting. I want to go shoot. I want to go shoot. I want to go shoot. What do you, why do you want to go shoot? Why? Tell me why and I'll take you. Right. Um, and one of them is very curious about the military. And, and uh, I said, why do you want to go to the military? I want to fight. Okay. And it's like watching Braveheart. Remember when he's like, he's like, but I want to fight. And he's like, I know you do son. He goes, but it's our wits that make us men. Right. Um, and so it's like, that's, that stands out to me is, Man is not spelled G-U-N. And I think that's a big, I don't want to say problem, because that problem, if you don't identify that you have that problem, if that's the way you think of, of life is G-U-N, right? That's called natural selection. That's a self-correcting problem. Because people that are all about just the gun or just, hey, shooting is easy. Shooting is easy. Shooting is easy. Well, shooting is easy. It is, it, and I've had a lot of great conversation with great minds in the industry like about this but there's nothing simple about being a shooter, right? Especially when you put it in context of why, when you get to people's why, because inevitably I'll ask you this question, what do people come to and when they discover their why? 
what's the typical why? When you when you strip everything else away, when people get down to it, why are they there? Why are we here? Because we love something more than ourselves. Yeah. And when people... And I think that's what they self... It's a self-reflection process. And that's what that intention does. That's what asking people why you're here. And then they have that opportunity to speak up and say it. And especially when one person sparks it, it starts firing off at that point. And then you start to realize that you all care. And that's the biggest reason why people take a class, not because of guns, because of compassion, which as you, you know, you probably get sick of me talking about. Um, I believe that's, you know, I, I read a bunch of crazy books and, and studied a lot of different people. And I, I, I you know, look back in, in history and I find that through thousands of years of, of warrior culture, right? People that are protectors, uh, whether you're a responsible armed citizen protecting yourself, your family, uh, other people in society, a law enforcement officer, military, uh, first responders that really care, that put others first, right, in a bad, horribly, you know, terrible situation. Um, why would you want to go into that? That's what we're trying to find out. We're asking, why are you here? Why, do, why would you want to carry a gun? Why do you want to have a concealed carry permit? Why do you want to open carry a gun? Why do you want to join the military? Why do you want to be a cop? Um, because of compassion. And then a lot of times as we, we find ourselves, we go into a bunch of places and we say, all right, let's talk about the first attribute of a warrior. Or somebody might ask me, Travis, what do you think is the number one thing that I need to have to be a good gunfighter, be a good warrior? And I'm like, well, compassion, obviously. And a lot of times I'm met with, well, what the f- does that have to do with battle or warfare? And we have to understand. And I think once you, you break into them and you say, okay, well, I think the old quote is nobody cares about what you know until they know what you care, right? And that's why- Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt. When we sit there in front of people and go, why are you here? Before we even do our introductions and then two hours later, we're not talking about us. The class has been talking about themselves for two hours. Isn't that the kind of environment you want to go to or you want to be involved? It needs to be about you, not about the instructors, not about the teachers. Yes, even though you're there to learn from us, we we always are grateful and appreciate that. Um, At the same time, that- student population that one or that 20 or that 60 100 whatever it is is all that matters because we care about them and because the more you care about something the harder you're going to fight for it right that's that's my definition personally of of why uh, my passion for what i do is so so great so enormous um because i know what it's like to lose everything i know it's like to come from nothing and And once once people realize the gravity of that through sharing stories sharing experiences one people once people realize what it means to be armed to carry a gun and they realize it's not simple sure training can be simple practice can be simple but real world application is as you've said the most complex thing you'll ever face yeah once people really digest that it's sobering to them then they real then they start really reflecting and thinking man why why am I really doing this? Yeah. This is important. I think everybody needs to ask that question. And, and if a lot of people out there that are the, you know, the influencer mentality or the ambassador shooters, you're on the internet, you're doing things, you're sharing with people. Look, there, there is absolutely nothing simple about being a shooter. Okay. They're simple concepts. I can teach a nutless monkey to pick up a gun and shoot it um, for the most part, right, in theory. But it's all the other things that come with it. You know, like there, there's the guys playing around upstairs with a twenty thousand dollar sniper rifle, and you know, I, I walk by, I'm like, dude, and they can shoot it, man. They'll go out there two thousand meters and ding, but they'll say that's easy. Well, it's because you have the equipment to do it. You got twenty grand worth of gun. I don't even know where they get the money to do that. I wouldn't even spend that much money on a gun, but um, they can do it. But if I ask them to lay in a hide for ten hours with ants and shit and snakes crawling past you in no 110 degrees and you can't eat, can't move, and you just look through a scope, most people wouldn't last 30 to 40 minutes, right? So there's all the other aspects, and that's just one example. That's like a guy laying on the ground with a precision rifle versus direct action, trying to go through a door where you know that there's somebody on the other side of it that has a machine gun that's and wants to most kill you. likely going to kill you or somebody else. Um, that's a very special kind of person that takes a compassionate person to do that. So absolutely. Um, 
it's it's all, all steel JP stuff here, man. That is not okay to say compassion. It's absolutely necessary to say that that is the number one thing that you have to have if you want to help others, right? And I think that goes back to the second principle uh, that we always talk about is vulnerability, which I think a lot of these people, when they are being vulnerable in their introductions in a class, and they have to say where they where they come from, what they do for a living, why they're here. Um, you know, we ask people to share their their success formulas. Like, what do you think of on a daily basis? And you wake up and put your feet on the ground. Do you say anything to yourself? Do you motivate yourself? Do you say anything to your kids? Do you have a formula for success for what you're about to go do today? No, that's fucking cheesy, man. Why would I do that? Because when you manifest something visually, when you when you do a visual representation of something that you want to achieve that day, guess what is more likely to happen if you say it and visualize it to yourself, right? You're going to probably be more inclined to do it. Um, it's because you're getting more repetitions in your mind. Your mind's like, hey, we're already thinking about doing this. Let's do it. Let's, let's accomplish this task. Let's make the bed, as, as McRaven would say, right? And then move on to other accomplishments. But people get very vulnerable in that sense. And I want people to, to, to understand the distinction between vulnerability, opening yourself up to an attack versus weakness, the inability to withstand attack. Those are two different things. What, what is it about the environment that's created? What do you think inspires people to be vulnerable in those situations in our, not necessarily in our introductions, but in our debriefs, it's, it's, it's incredible. The, the amount of emotion that we see and the vulnerability. What, what do you think inspires that? Self-reflection, discovery, uh, listening to other people's stories. And I think that's the thing is where a lot of instructors will come out and be like, here's the two cents. All right, here's the curriculum. We got to do this. We don't have a whole lot of time in three or two days to teach. And you don't give a lot of opportunity to listen to people. And, uh, like a nine Which, to two schedule. Who the fuck does that? <laughs> don't even say it. <laughs> Don't go to that person. That's <laughs> a, we don't have a schedule, man. We teach. We we. Uh, I mean, we typically will have a starting time, uh, but we <laughs> in Texas we went what eight o'clock to ten o'clock the other night on a D five handgun course. You know, yeah, it was um, amazing. And it's because not because we're forcing people to stay there, it's because they just keep asking questions and they keep engaging, and it's like this campfire talk all day long. And uh, and and people once they get a taste of being vulnerable and they understand how to work through that, um, they can't stop. And so I, I think at the end of the class, when you hear this emotional feedback from people um, and you, you see how they've, they've th that the reflection has been shaped over the course of three days by listening to somebody else be vulnerable and tell their story and then listening to somebody else be vulnerable. And they're like, why am I not being vulnerable? I think it's a peer pressure aspect. It's, an, an, it's a teacher or shared induced stress, you know, when we say, hey, we want all of you to share. Does that facilitate more valuable questioning from a shooting standpoint or a gear standpoint or think about questions in the lab on the range when you're you, overall more vulnerable yeah absolutely i think i think it's one of the bigger keys in life than even maybe being compassion you know even in compassion you got to care right but maybe um, one of the bigger keys in learning learning yeah and i shouldn't say in comparison to the other principle but uh in learning because if well what's the definition of vulnerability right it's it's the courage to be imperfect in my opinion. Um, and it's, it means that you have to be the best. You have to be the best, which means you have to put yourself first. Now, a lot of people have a problem with that. And no, I put others first. I always put my family, I put, you know, God, country or God, family, country, me, you know, it's like, okay, that's a shitty priority. Sorry. It is for me. Um, because it depends on the situation that I'm in. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to get into theology or crazy stuff or, or, but like, if you look at, I, I think everybody knows the, the book, the, the men, the mission than me, I always mention like, dude, that's a great book, but I wish there was another book, the men, the mission than me. That's when you're in combat, right? That's when you're in combat. You put the men, the mission, then me first, that in that order. But when you're not in those bad situations, I put myself first. I put myself first, right? Because that's what God would want me to do is to be a better version of myself so I can then therefore help others that I serve. Um, and if I'm not being the best that I can possibly be for myself, which is one of my, my innate drives in, in the military, you know, I wanted to go to that school because I always knew somebody's probably going to rely on me one day to be the best at this. Uh, whether it's 
you know, taking a shot on something that's critical, um, like a hostage situation or worst case, you know, explosive vest or S vest or having a problem at 35,000 feet or 25,000 feet and we're doing a hey-ho or halo operation. Like you can't half-ass that. You have to be a master. Um, and, think- so, and so that vulnerability, if you don't have that, how are you supposed to create true mastery? Because if you look back at a lot of the books that we read about warrior culture, right? Whether you look back to the, the great ones that we always know about, the samurai, right? The Book of Five Rings, the Book of Dakota, the, the, samurai, the, the, the samurai, the three, the five, the seven code. You look at the, the Spartan code, the creeds that we have around our military, the Reconnaissance Creed, the Navy SEALs Creed, the SF Creed, and all that stuff. You look at those creeds, you don't see shit about guns and gear in it. Nothing. It's all compassion, vulnerability, taking care of yourself, health and wellness, having a vision. Um, you know, like Jordan Peterson's book right here is kind of a, that's why I love this book. I just got it. I haven't even got into it heavy yet, but the 12, uh, 12 more rules for life. And you look at a lot of these, I'm not going to go into them in depth, but um, obviously he's an incredible mind. And when you, you look at these chapters and you compare them to a lot of these older codes, um, Imagine who you could be and then aim single-mindedly at that. Okay, I want to be a force recon marine one day. I aim single-mindedly at that. Now, was there just one thing I had to focus on to become that? No, we're the jack of all trades. Um, but that's a, that's a warrior code. Um, do not hide unwanted things in the fog. Um, that's a big deal. Like you talk about lack of vulnerability and nowadays, like the vet that comes back or the law enforcement officer that saw something bad or the rape victim or their kid that's traumatized by parents or, you know, abuse or something like that. That's the worst thing that you can be is not vulnerable in those situations. So that vulnerability allows you to shape yourself and share, share authentically. And the next thing you know, you're not resisting as much, right? Because I think being vulnerable and sharing um, is, again, you going off of the world as a form, and if I share that to somebody else, as we do in our classes, as you see everybody stand up and share their stories, people all of a sudden go, damn, I, I, we're, we almost have the same life. We almost all have the same life. A great book, by the way, is um, Scott Spooner, Tom Spooner's brother. You probably see both those guys out there on the internet and in our industry for uh, Bravo Company USA. They're, they're gunfighters on there. But Scott wrote a book called Your Life. I wish I had it upstairs, but it's a short little read called Your Life. And I remember when he handed it to me at SHOT Show one year, a long time ago, I said, your life. And I looked at him and he's like, what? I said, just curious. He's like, what are you, you asking yourself? Who am I to, to tell you about, what your, do you know about, about, about life? your life? And I was like, eh, maybe something along those lines. He's like, just read the book. You'll see. And the first damn thing it talks about is, is I'm sure you're wondering why it says your life. And who is Scott Spooner to tell you who your life is? And when I started reading it, the whole book, I was like, holy shit, we all kind of have the same life. We share a lot we all of the, have the same, same goals. Thing. We all have the same ambitions. I mean, think about when, when you said me, then the men, then the mission, or me, then the mission, then the men. What do you want for your family? What do you want for your spouse? Wouldn't, I mean, I know I would want the absolute best for my wife. I would want her to take care of herself. I want my kids to take care of themselves. I would want to make the, each and every day better by helping them care for themselves that that's what we really want for the ones that we everybody wants to care the most about and everybody has the same goals we want to be free to make our own decisions do what we want to do chase our own goals be ambitious take care of our family love the ones we love and be left the hell alone so yeah your life is not so different than mine yeah awesome book yeah um but I think that's what you'll see is whether it was Scott's comments about that, whether it's, you know, JP or Jordan Peterson's or a lot of the other great authors out there that, that have really taken things from our history and reminded us to say, hey, these things have always been talked about. And if you go into the military and law enforcement, as you know, there's not a lot of these things that are talked about. If you walked in and said, hey, guys, sit down. All right. Today's team lesson is going to be on um, 12 more rules for life. <laughs> They're going to start throwing shit at me. Get at What are you talking about, man? We're going to drink beer. Gonna, Elliot you know, whatever, be like, shoot guns, 12 whatever. more laws? 12 more laws? Yeah, like laws. <laughs> what do you mean? Rules? Laws? Um, no, they're, they're, and again, you know, this is, this is funny because some people are out there like, what the fuck are they talking about? 
if you're not tracking on some of these things that we talk about, it's because it's simply not your time, right? And we say that a lot in class. There's going to be people that will get it and they'll realize how to take their life and put it back into their shooting, for one example, um, or they won't and they won't get it. And they, they won't get it until maybe they see something horrible. Um, but then you even have those people that we know, guys that have been through hell and back, um, both in their life, family, lost people, lost family, lost a lot of stuff, lost parts of themselves, um, have seen horrible, horrible things. They, some of them just aren't ready for it. And, and they will go to their grave holding on to that and resisting. So I think if we can all start you know, um, and we, we laughed about this earlier. We were talking to Trevor on the team earlier about life, right? Age and perspective. And, um, you know, I, I hope that people don't have to go out there and experience something terribly horrible to go wrong and then have to go, oh, my God, I need to change my life. Oh, my God, I need to start thinking about these things. I need to start putting my family first. Um, I, need, I need to start training, right? Oh, shit, I couldn't get over that fence and get away from that dog. I couldn't get away from that, that person that was chasing me through my house. That was their catalyst. That, that was their catalyst. But how many people have gone through that and just don't do shit about it? They don't want to change. They just stay the same. Uh, that's a smaller percentage, I think, of the population that, of people that we could do without. That's natural selection. And, again, those, some of those people are my family members. I'm like, guys, you got to pull your head out of your ass. Why are we fighting about this? Why are we? Uh, they just, it's just not their time could be in their 90s, like Matt was telling us earlier. Like his grandma's like finally realizing, man, I, I did a really good job. Where all her life she said I didn't. It's like, no, it's okay, grandma. It's just now it's your time to finally understand that. Sometimes we get that when we're 13. Sometimes we get it when we're 93. And so I think we take the road of sharing and being vulnerable um, because we know what it's like to be at rock bottom. And we know that the only way to – to look at rock bottom differently is to be vulnerable and go, okay, what's going on in my life? What am I, what am I doing right now? That's horribly wrong, stupid. And what am I going to do to fix it? And what if I single, singly mindfully work on that one thing? Like one of the rules that he just stated in his book, um, guess what's probably going to happen. You're probably going to deliberately be able to practice your way through that situation. Um, but you have to have the vulnerability first in order to do that. You have to have the willingness to put yourself first so you can serve others better. Um, and allow others to help you, well, which is really, really hard sometimes for people to to be that vulnerable and say, I need help, to raise that hand and, and say, hey, I need somebody to pull me up. What about me? Instead of being so damn independent all the time. Yeah, there's a, a book that I mentioned sometimes, um, The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse. I heard this on another podcast at one point in time. So I went and read it. It's a kid's book. And... Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? The horse asked the, the boy or something like that a question. Uh, he says, what's the hardest, what's the hardest question for a human to ask or for anybody to ask? And uh, the boy's like, what? And he says, for help. Like, it's very hard for us to ask for help. It's very hard because we, and if it is hard for you to ask for help in something in your life, maybe you're hurting on bills financially, right? Maybe because the world's changing a little bit. Things cost more money. Things are harder to get. Um, resources are going away. Well, you're always left with resourcefulness, as we teach in our classes. Um, so one of the biggest things that that is always resourceful, you always have, is the ability to go, hey, Jared, I, I need a little help, man. Can you can you can I run something past you and you, you kind of give me some advice? What do you do in this situation for family, for finances, for anything? Which is an, an open policy for here at 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 the at Haley Strategic and the businesses that we have here, um, anybody should be able to ask anybody about anything because the world's a forum. There's no, yes, there's a hierarchy in every organization, but there should always be an open door for vulnerability uh, because that's where people truly grow, you know. That only happens in the right environment, though. And it has to be the right environment. That's tough. That's very hard for people to create that environment. And it is a, I'm mean, dude, it's tough. Every day, you know, the, the executive team and the managers here, and as you as well, especially on the training team, you know this more than anybody, how hard it is and how much it takes out of us in just three short days of a class to, to create those catalysts for people. Now we got 60 whatever plus people just here in Scottsdale and every day you're dealing with something. Somebody's being vulnerable and you're like, some days you got to catch yourself like, man, I can't do this again today. Like, wait, no, that's what I created and I have to because that's, but then you start getting burnt out and until you realize, well, shit, maybe I need to be vulnerable and go take care of myself 
And I'm like, hey, Matt, I'm taking the day off. I'm going to go rock climb, do something, get, it, get my head space right. Because if I don't do that, I'm not helping anybody. Um, not being at my best doesn't help anybody, in my opinion. So that's where I think that vulnerability comes in. Um, and I think it allows people, once they start sharing that, to find their purpose. Right, which you were talking about earlier is right. what is that? What is your purpose? And how do you define that? And why do so many people have so many problems with it nowadays? That's a daily battle for some. Mm -hmm. That's a daily question you've got to ask yourself. Um, I, w I want to share something to that. Um, this is from our D5 class in, in Texas a few weeks ago, well, earlier this month. Um, this gentleman writes, D5 in Texas was a piece of trash, and I want my money back. <laughs> that did get our attention. He writes on, I'm All sure right. that got your attention. All right, we'll open this email. <laughs> I'm sure I got your attention, but now the truthful brain dump that could not be conveyed in the short time during debrief. So this was received about a week, a week after class. He writes, I originally signed up for D5 class so I could start preparing to become proficient enough at carbine shooting to take D3 with a friend in September. However, shortly after arriving to class, my plans were derailed. The introductions were an eye-opener when Travis asked, truly, why we were here taking the course. I could have easily said to be good enough to take D3, yet I began to self-reflect and think about my purpose for training in general. There's that word, purpose. The honest answer that came out was I was training to protect my family. Compassion. Throughout the presentations, the team explained why we should operate in certain ways from a biomechanics perspective, which I love, but that really caught my attention. But what really caught my attention were the discussions on why people do things in any life situation from a varied emotional or mental state. These discussions led to a deeper conversation and an openness from the entire class that you typically only get from your tight-knit circle, if you're lucky. The chief expressed an unapologetic and bold compassion for directing people away from replicating his life mistakes. The hammer oozed an infectious, joyful confidence in every situation, no matter how dire. You remember the hammer, he don't was, you? Uh, he was incredible. Yeah. Travis's open komodo showed his heart is for people which he gracefully gives compassion without judgment this was not what i expected from a quote shooting class unquote close quotes to say the least as the class continued i learned to feel where i was making mistakes in the execution of handling the firearm but more importantly i began to introspect and feel where i'm making mistakes in other aspects of my life i walked into class thinking it was a self-improvement course on firearms manipulation but what I discovered is that it was a detox clinic. I may not be a drug addict or an alcoholic, but my life and relationships do need a cleansing. That's, that's, that's incredible. The class was about understanding why things happen, why you should do certain things to maximize your effectiveness and being deliberate in your executions. The answers to these questions and purposeful practice from a firearms handling standpoint is straightforward math and science. However, Prior to graduation, I would have said the answers to those questions and being deliberate in your actions for better outcomes from a social perspective is rather complex. Post-graduation, I don't see it that way. To put it plainly, being deliberate in giving love, compassion, grace, and understanding through communication can reduce the negative outcomes that make the world around us much better. Mm. Paraphrasing what Travis said, quote, sometimes you gotta shoot a motherfucker in the face. But many times it doesn't need to get to that point. <clears throat> Close quote. I don't think I said it exactly like that. But <laughs> He said paraphrase. Keep going. He did say paraphrase. <laughs> In closing, I want to thank the entire team for the class experience. The instructors gave invaluable guidance and never once made us feel inadequate. That level of support and positivity is a massive confidence boost that can only bear more fruit from the students. If I was to relate or restate my answer to the initial question, why are you taking this course? My answer would be to protect my family, those around me, when, and those around me when called, because I would gladly put myself in harm's way out of love for my fellow man. See you again in a future. See you again in a future D three carbine to zero my rifle, after I complete zeroing myself. That's pretty deep. Who is that? 
Eric Ostland. Eric, wow, thanks, man. <clears throat> so, very. How how much did he talk about shooting in there? Was that the was that the? Well, I mean, one line maybe. Yeah, but that was. And and that's typical, you know that. And I, and I know you're reading that because it's there's, that's the joy that we get, sharing information, sharing our own lives, and creating that that catalyst for change for people to like it's emotional man it's fucking awesome and that speaks to purpose when you ask about purpose that's um you know i started um i started this book just about a week ago away the superior man and i'm only a few chapters in but one that I had to reread several times speaks specifically to purpose and how our purpose can be ever changing and how once you reach your core purpose, that's when you're able to freely give yourself mm -hmm. authentically and give yourself in a, in a, from a source of love and that we spend, I thought it was interesting. He, he referenced that, that purpose, his purpose for being there, his why. And our true purpose, as stated in this book, and it, this really spoke to me, is surrounded by concentric levels of purpose that as you move away from your core purpose are lesser purposes. And when you go through experiences that may tear into that lesser purpose, you think, well, why did this happen to me? Or it may be an, a, negative, a negative event, some type of catalyst. And you, you question that event. Why did it happen to you? Well, it may just be pushing you closer and closer to your purpose. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, we we think, why are we talking so deeply about this when, you know, this was a shooting class? Well, obviously, something about the environment makes everyone look inside and question their purpose for being there. We don't just step out on the on the range and go to shooting guns. I don't, I don't need you to be a better shooter. I need you to be a better human being. I, cause again, the, the, the shooting part does come easy. As some people out there say, they'd say shooting is easy, but life is not. Life is incredibly complex, multifaceted every single day. It's constantly dynamically changing. And now you have to incorporate a firearm into that. Okay. Maybe you should be good at life first. Because the gun's just a tool, right? It's just a skill set that, that you need to learn, which there's a lot to it. I'm not trying to downplay shooting at all, but, and, and, and I know the reason why you're sharing that is um, because that's that's what drives us, right? And that's, I'm not, I know you're not reading that because we're tooting our own horn that we're, you know, a great training organization. We know we're a great training organization. We know we've mastered things. Do we still screw up? Yeah, that's the definition of a master, but you know why, right? And you can help share that and explain it to other people. Um, by sharing your own vulnerabilities, your own weaknesses, um, and telling people, like, what, what's the first thing I say? Hey, our primary responsibility as instructors slash teachers, which we're very careful of using those terminologies because you can't teach literally, literally, you can't teach anybody anything, right? I can't, I wish I could push a button in your forehead and go, Doop, there it is. You now have all the information that the I matrix. have. I can read this book and just go bloop and plug it in, right? Yeah, we don't have the matrix. Yeah. I'm sure somebody's working on it, but we're in the matrix, Travis. Oh, I forgot. See, it's already working. <laughs> <laughs> but you were saying our job is to protect what? To protect our students? To protect our students from our own preconceived notions and patterns and everything that we've seen and done in our lives. But right? what, what do you, because it, it might what work do you for mean us. by that? What do you specifically mean by well, that? Well, I probably share the Bruce Lee concept. I mean, that's the, the he's the one who started it. Um, or started to share that philosophy in modern history of martial arts to where, you know, man created method, not that method created man. So don't twist yourself into somebody else's preconceived notions or patterns or experience just because it unquestionably works for them. It doesn't mean it's going to work for you. So that's where his programs are more about the human, the person, right? Not about this martial art you have to do. Right, uh, well, we this, can all be adaptive. Method. We can all flow and crash and do whatever we want, like water. Right, and I, I really, I really latched onto that principle, and that was, I mean, not even too long ago, maybe five, six years ago, when I started reading Bruce Lee stuff, and I realized, like, man, this guy had an amazing philosophy, which is a part of being a warrior as well. I now realize in the later parts of my life, um, 
And I wish I had learned it sooner. I really wish. Because I know if you look back and study great warriors, they were taught that from early, early ages, the principles of man, the principles of what you should do as a man, as a protector. Um, and you grew up with those principles, and then you were given weapons. Well, now people are given weapons like, hey, uh, figure out why you're here. It's like, whoa, we are doing this ass backwards, people. And we wonder why we don't have purpose left in this country. And a lot of people are like, whoa, what are you talking about, Travis? If you go to an old folks home and you ask somebody, what's the difference between now and World War I time frames when there was depressions and, you know, recessions and, and riots in the streets and racial wars and everything else? And I say, was, was life, you know, hey, hey, dad, hey, grandpa, was life really that, was it worse back then than it is right now? And our perception is that it's worse. They'd say, no. We've always had hard times. We've always had war. We've always had struggles. And, you know, like my grandfather was like, when's the last time you were in a war where 400,000 people were lost? And I'm like, mm, never mind. <clears throat> you know, so, yeah, the wars were a little different back then than what they are today with technology, of course. However, war is war, right? Dying is dying. Sacrifice is sacrifice. Um, but when you ask them, well, then what's different? Maybe America's lost its purpose, right? Like those layers the, that you're talking about in that book, like you're starting to get farther and farther away from it versus closer to it. Maybe we've gotten bored. Maybe big red, white, and blue and living the American dream is boring nowadays. You know, so we have to make shit up. It's too easy. Yeah. It is. It is too easy because we've made it too easy. And that's why I'm okay with struggle. I'm okay with catastrophe. I'm okay with the markets crashing. I'm okay with filing for bankruptcy and this whole place burning to the ground. I'm okay with that because I've accepted the fact that that reality can absolutely and has happened to me before in my life. Now, I'm going to do everything in my power to prevent that, of course. But if we collectively as a country don't become very fucking vulnerable right now and reach down and grab our compassion and pull it up and create some some purpose, some significance out of it... Um, then that's a serious problem, you know. I think um, there was, what was that thing that I had? Like this old quote I read to you earlier, I had, I had money, right? You can have a lot of money in your life, but it doesn't mean you have any meaning. You can have a lot of power, but you can have no purpose. You can have a lot of houses, but no home. You can have lust, but no love. You can have hard times, but no healing times. That's a big problem today. You've had violence in your life, but zero vulnerability. Just like you can have a lot of success, but zero significance. And I think that's, if you look at, look at our home, America, it's kind of just a house right now. Because we don't like who's managing the fucking yard <laughs> or the property. We don't like who's cutting the grass. Um, we don't like who's, um, you know, selling us our groceries and getting our gas and everything right now because it's too expensive. Well, we forget that it's a republic only if we can keep it. So if we don't want to keep it, then I am... I'm going to do that until the end times, right? Uh, but a lot of people are okay with not doing anything for it. And so, therefore, that purpose gets farther and farther away. And so we somehow have to bring that back. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're doing this is to continually share these principles and these conversations, just like we have conversations like this in our class, man. And it really it really allows people to go back and self-reflect. I'm like, damn, we're, we don't live here very long. We are not. Whether you're a young kid right now and you can't fathom it, whether you're in your mid-40s like me or whether you're 90 years old right now, um, yeah, probably the older we get, the more real we realize that, man, we're not on this earth very long. And sometimes you have to go through catastrophic events to realize that, like, shit, I, been, I should be fucking dead. I should not be here. Trust me, I should, not, I should not be here from all the crap that I've done that was just really bad decisions in my life. Um, and I'm lucky, um, but I'm vulnerable. And I share those things that I've done wrong. I share those times that I've fucked up royally. And uh, and that's the best thing that we can all do. That's what I do with my kids every day. I'm not going to hold things back. My my father and, and that generation and before him, my grandfather, they held a lot of stuff back. They didn't they didn't talk about much because they had to be stoic. They had to be, you know, the super generation, the greatest generation. Um, and we didn't want to show weakness. Like, well, it's not fucking weakness. It's vulnerability. It's a big difference. You know, you can't even go to your teammates nowadays in the military and be like, hey, bro, you sleeping all right? Don't put that shit on me, Ricky Bobby. Like, whoa, whoa, I just asked him, dude, come on, man. We, we just got done kicking doors for seven months together. Like, kind of need a little bit of bro help here. Yeah, fuck you, bro. You're a, you're a liability now. That's a problem. That's a serious problem. Um, 
that goes back to that, hey, you're keeping it in the fog concept, like Jordan Peterson says, not to do. Because when you do that, when you keep things in the fog and you don't talk about them, you are not mastering vulnerability because vulnerability means putting it on the table and talking about it, opening it up, dissecting it, sequencing it. And when when you do that, you mentioned your your boys, your kids. When you do that with your your sons, do are they receptive, or do you think, um, you know, we we kind of talked about this um, several times over the last few months with our our kids. When you got nuggets of wisdom from your dad when you were in your teens. Did you take that for what for the graph for what it was truly worth, or did you think, yeah, yeah, you don't, you're out of touch, Dad? Do you think your your <laughs> kids do that now? You know, that's a good question. I, I've never really, I should have thought about that. I would have to say yes. I took in everything. Did I process it? Is another question. Not all of it. Um, you I, had you have an older sibling, right? Right, my brother. Yeah. Who who did you take? that advice from more your brother or your dad and in my case my dad my brother was more the authority the big brother don't do this don't do that stay away from drugs no nah, beat your ass um versus dad was more the the silent com- <clears throat> compassionate you know teacher the warrior like he was savage and but just nothing but love in his in his heart you know so I could talk to him about things. And then when he would say things, they would, they would maybe resonate a little bit different depending on what I was going through. So like, for example, um, my first love, right, breaks up with me. She's a senior. I'm a freshman. Hottest chick in school. Man. I know. I was doing well. You were playing. And then I ruined it. Um, and so I'm, I'm heartbroken, man. It's the first time I'm really heartbroken. I'm sitting on the front porch on the farm, um, and I'm just kind of crying off into distance. And my dad comes out six next to me. And this is the first time that we had this kind of thing. And he goes, um, after, you know, a bunch of heartfelt conversation, he says, well, son, just remember this. Only the strong survive. So I'm like, fucking roger that. <laughs> <laughs> what the um, hell does that mean in this case, dad? <laughs> oh, yeah. And, 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 so, and so, but I, I, I think I realized over time that, well, what, what was he talking about, man? Like, to physically strong? So I, I figured, well, be physically strong as possible. So, of course, I would go out and interpret it as, go be physically strong. Don't let shit like this bother you. Well, I, I don't understand the mental strength and capacity needed at that point in time yet. So I go hit the gym. I run. I swim seven miles every freaking Saturday morning down the river to get ready for going to the military and be a swimmer. Um, I'm working out nonstop, running crazy. But it took me most all of my life to figure out what he meant by only the strong survive. Well, there could be so many different aspects of that as we look at now from the concept of, well, strong men create good times, right? Um, that's one of them for me. So I realized that we in life, we step up. Like right now, this is, if, you're, if you're in the industry, in the shooting industry, you know, we hear all these stories of people, these great iconic men and, and women in our past that have given us the platform to sit right here and share this information or to, to share how to, to defend yourself. Um, we are that era right now. People will be relying on us and looking back on this day of what we are creating right now. That is authentic. That is genuine. That shows that we really, truly care. Um, I think like some of the great ones in our industry from the past, um, you know, the Colonel Coopers and I'll name them all, but those guys were generally compassionate about defense for people, right? And, and making this country a little bit stronger. And, um, and we need to remember that. And, uh, but you got to be vulnerable in order to do it. Um, and I think with that, you have to see the forest, right? That's where you're like, what is the purpose? And how do I, how do I get there now? Because that's complex. So I think the best thing to do is sit down. And as an exercise for yourself, like we, we do here, you know, we, we sit down. Like you just did an amazing exercise of the day with our instructor staff. And I did it with our black side, uh, black side design team and uh, took a piece of paper and said, hey, why are you here? Just literally with just that. You don't need any other context. Why are you here? Now, you, you might be like, well, what do you mean? Like, what, why am I in this job? Why do I carry a gun? Why do I, why am I on this earth? Yeah, I'm, maybe. I'm here because you told me to be here today. <laughs> Let's just start with why are you here in general on earth, right? Why did you get chosen to have a, out of a one in 400 trillion chance to become a human being? Why are you here and what are you going to do with that small micro 
the, the that one in 400 trillion, you can't even fathom how small that is. Um, but you're here. So what are you doing with it? And, uh, and, and everybody's going to have a different answer. Everybody's at a different time. Everybody has a different buy-in, right? Like you could be an 18 year old kid. I want to get a job right now so I can get money to buy a car, right? Or get money to buy a phone or, um, I'm in my twenties. Now I'm trying to stabilize. I just got married. I'm trying to get my shit straightened out. I need to get my career working out. And then in my thirties, now I'm settling down, having families and everything changed. So your buy-in might change. Like I need money or I just need purpose, right? Or I just need security or I just need this or that or whatever it is. Um, when, when do you think the question of purpose pops up for most people? You think it's that like in general? Yeah. I mean, maybe you were a little bit, maybe you were different. But I think about our kids and the youth of today and goals versus purpose. Now, I know goals and purpose are two different things, but for the average person, do you think that question of purpose pops up almost in their late 30s, early 40s, maybe? I, I remember hearing Brene Brown talk about the universe reaching down and whispering, you can't escape me. And, <laughs> and, and people, now I'm paraphrasing, but Nobody gets off the spaceship alive. Nobody gets off the spaceship alive. And is, is that when that realization, do you think that's when most people start thinking, why am I here? What have I been doing with my life? What's my purpose? Am I, what I, I, I know I'm a tree in a forest, but I can only see me and the trees around me. What's the forest? What's the purpose? I think the timing's important there as well, right? And and I agree with a lot of great minds out there that like hey, <clears throat> if you're in your 20s right now, you need to be crushing yourself. <laughs> you need to be killing yourself. You need to be and, and and a lot of people would be like uh, you know, I don't I don't uh I don't need to be doing that right away. It's like no, you need to be finding yourself. You need to be finding what your limits are. You need to Find be pushing your yourself mentally and physically, working your ass off. Work twenty five hours a day if you can. Well, there's no twenty five. Stop questioning me. Just do it. <laughs> Why? It's a different mentality though now. It is different mentality, but it's the same world. It is, and that's the problem. Is that once every all this fancy stuff goes away, you're left with the only the only thing you're left with is the ability to work hard and and continue that stuff and build it back up again. Um. I think it's because of the self-reliance aspect is we're losing self-reliance, right? Um, the other day I'm yelling down my kids on the bottom of the rock, we're rock climbing. I was like, Hey, just come on, man. Time figure, figure eight knot in there. And then, and then, and then hook it through this way and do this. And he's like, dad, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, why don't you know what I'm talking about? I'm like, wait a minute. Damn it. I'm supposed to be teaching this. I haven't told him. <laughs> I was like, shit, I need to make my kids more self-reliant. They don't even know basic knots. And I thought they did. So, um, and, and that's that's not just a prepper thing. That's just life rules, man. You may have to tie something onto a trailer one day and improvise something, boat work. You know, how many times have we done that on the farm? Um, like, be more reliant. So I think that's um, that's one of the biggest issues in today's world. But if you're in your 30s and you're questioning that, at that point, is it because you didn't push yourself as hard as you should have in your 20s and now you're wondering what your purpose is? I don't know. I'm just asking. I don't, I'm not being objective here or absolute. I'm just saying that I knew when, when I was 13 years old what I was going to be. And I was driven and I did it. it took me a bit. Um, and then when I was into my 30s, I was already, already on my way to, okay, I already completed that part of my life. You know, I've been in the, in the Marines now for, you know, almost 15 years by the time I stepped off the reserve status and went um, – and started in a private practice, you know, after all the contracting and everything else, I was seizing opportunities everywhere, but that lane of where I wanted to go and what my purpose was, was set because I set it early. What your goal was. It's different from purpose. Yes. But I think I just had that purpose to, I guess, as a kid, when I grew up on the blood soaked, you know, horror stories of my dad and, and, and especially my grandfather in World War II. Um, and, and my family history back eight generations, it's it's like, dude, that's my destiny. I have to do that, right? Now, I don't think that way anymore. And if my kids came up today as the ninth generation and said, Dad, I'm not joining the military, I'm like, okay, thank God. Right? Because right now, it's a tough question to ask. Do I want them being led by certain people right now? Not really. I don't. Um, do I want them to be men of honor and 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 
compassionately care about where they live and where they come from and being the last free stand on earth. Yeah. We need strong men again to stand up and do that. And they can do that anywhere. They don't have to do it in the military. That is true. Right. They as long as, and, and that's what I tell them, as long as they contribute to society in some way, shape or form, it's all I care about, but I'm trying to help them find a little bit more purpose every day. And I think the purpose can change, right? Well, my purpose for a long time was be a Marine and serve my country, right? And put foot to ass anytime I'm, I'm asked to do it. And, um, but then that purpose changes. You start to go, okay, I'm not doing that anymore. Um, I've, I can only do that so much in my life. And I didn't feel that that purpose was really 100% because I wasn't getting what I needed, what I felt I needed. So my new purpose changed to I need to share information. I need to go out there and research, find the answers, because a lot of these people don't care to do it in the military. That was your core purpose. Everything you were doing up until even today was peeling those layers away in the experiences that shaped you to get you to this point. That's right. And I still like people say, well, what do you, uh, what's your purpose now? I'm like, I think we're about to find out. And, and that's a big thing for vets out there too. Cause it was a big conversation in our communities, especially the veteran communities. It's like, they will make that time of their life, whether they spent four years in the military or 25 years in the military, they will say that was their entire life. And that's what they revolve everything around. And it's so hard to break them out of that mindset, especially for me getting out of the military at the time that I did. People are like, are you crazy? Just stay in five more years, dude, and retire. I'm like, I don't want to do that. I, I don't feel that's my purpose anymore. And so I think those things can, can shift. So you think it's okay with an individual not knowing what comes next? Uncertainty. Absolutely. That's what life's all about, right? Uncertainty? Yeah. I think... Um, A lot of people would drive themselves bat soup crazy. Um, well, you can't say that anymore. It's cobra, cobra venom now. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you some links. Okay, it's weird. I didn't know that was. That's a whole other podcast. Yeah. <laughs> it's a whole other podcast. <laughs> um, the hell were we talking about? <laughs> Go bat soup crazy. Not, <laughs> not knowing what's next. <clears throat> so I think people will drive themselves crazy, trying to be certain about what's coming. What's happening today? What's what's happening? You know, uh, okay, it's already okay. It's already four o'clock. What's going to happen at five o'clock? What's going to happen tomorrow? Uh, are my kids going to pass school? Am I going to get this job? Am I going to get this promotion? Am I actually going to be that thing that I want to be one day? Um, well, you keep challenging uncertainty. Well, then you're going to be introduced to what it really truly brings you, um, and that's going to be disappointment because any time that you are trying to be so uncertain about something that you can't. Physically, you cannot, I believe, predict the future. Obviously, we don't know what's going to happen in five seconds, five days, five weeks from now. So the true nature of life, as I've always said, um, in comparison to something else, like uh, if I had this fresh cup of coffee, right, and it was fresh, poured, and you stuck your finger in there, would you say that's hot or cold out of the machine it just came out of? It would be warm. Why are you messing this up, man? <laughs> It would be hot. It would be really hot. <laughs> I knew that would no, stop like, you. So fire. Okay, if we've started a fire right here and you touched it, you'd be like, that's, that's hot. Nobody, if we asked a thousand people, would anybody go like, damn, that was cold? Oof. No, they would not, right? So like the true nature of fire is hot. I believe the true nature of life is uncertainty. And you will drive yourself crazy trying to be certain. And that's what we do. You know, I got to be certain. I got to be able to pay these bills. I got, I got, I got. And you start creating a racket. And the racket are things in your life that are unwanted, but yet still persist. And uncertainty can then breed what? Fear. Well, fear, because but it's pe a lack people of don't knowledge. Wanna, people don't want to be fearful, but that's an important part of life. Yeah. Embracing I'm, uncertainty and the fear aspect, because it can make you sharper. I think I wrote this the other day when you ask us to write our um, wise. wise, right? Why we're here, <clears throat> I wrote, life's uncertainty is not a problem that should ever be solved. It's, it's rather, it's a reality. It's experiences. It's, it's discoveries. It should be flowed with. You should embrace it. You should not resist it. Uh, because resistance is the precursor to suffering. Um, so anything, anything you don't want in life, um, don't resist it. If you want it to persist, resist it. Um, and so with that, knowing that I can't, I can't be certain about an uncertain reality. Um, 
I'm not going to try to take a human narrative and change that Mother Nature way of being. Because you can't. You'll drive your fucking self crazy. You cannot change Mother Nature. You cannot change people. You can't change. That's like in our classes. Our job is not to tell them what to do. It's not to give them advice. It's not to be assholes or toxic. It's to simply share information, right? Because if you're trying to then force somebody's physics to change, that's like changing the position of the sun. You can't do it. It's nonsensical. You can't have that conversation. So with that knowing of... The knowledge of uncertainty or the knowledge, like you said earlier, right? Nobody gets off the spaceship alive. The knowledge of my certain death provides me the focus and drive to be alive. And so with that, I'm not going to fuck this one in 400 trillion chance up. I'm going to do whatever it takes to help as many people as possible because that's what I truly feel my purpose is, is to help people right now. And it's because of all the experiences that I've had in my life. It's not just because I was a Marine or just because I was a dad or just because I was a husband. It's just like, it's everything combined. And I think the more we live, the more we realize, the more curious you become, the more wisdom you create, like Socrates said. So I love risk and uncertainty. And I think everybody should. Everybody should have some type of love for risk and uncertainty. And I know for some people it's very hard, especially if they're really systemized people, people that love security, Um, Like my brother would argue, I'd say, hey, look, you don't like risk and uncertainty. Start a business, man. You've been in the Marine Corps for 28 years. When are you going to retire? I'm just, I just, I I just got to wait for the right opportunity. That's a racket. Keep saying that. Okay. Um, So like that's, that's, and that's his deal. And he's good at that world. He's good at systemizing. He's good at being an executive officer. He's good at the only world he knows at this point. It is. And the only world I've ever known was uncertainty, right? I didn't have a system when I was growing up. I was a troublemaker. I was in and out of jail. Um, I was a redneck. My first job was catching rattlesnakes for belt makers and boot makers in the, in the woods in North Florida. Um, and then an electrician after that. So it was always in the hard skills, labor world, you know, climbing in attics at 130 degrees. Um, had an opportunity to play football, join the Marines at 17 instead, and just always had that uncertain life, special operations, contracting, you name it. Um, took a lot of risk and a lot of uncertainty. And a lot of people look at me and go, man, you're just all over the place, dude. You're crazy. You got too many things going on at one time. It's like, yeah, it's because I love risk and uncertainty. It's it's not because I, I don't want boredom. I don't want a normal life. What the fuck is that? A baseball game and barbecue? <laughs> you know, it's like, no, I want I want to not know what's going to happen next because I want to see what happens. And and I think that's just the the true nature that allows us here to thrive and grow because I have systemizers making sure I don't go too crazy. <laughs> that's what you're here for. Um, but I, th- I think that's that's how I would clarify or define the uncertainty of life. We started all this, this conversation with the bridge. And we build bridges. We build bridges between people. What do you think one of the biggest obstacles within our industry is? Why do you think more bridges aren't built? Maybe they think they're building bridges. Maybe say they say, this is the pathway, do it this way, everybody else is wrong. It, it's almost like a bunch of piranhas sometimes in the industry. Somebody falls in the water and poof, oh, I mean, it would be eat them alive. It would be, uh, unfortunately, um, a lack of vulnerability, a lack of compassion, a lack of seeing the force for your students, right? Because if you're not getting, and again, I'm not, I, you're not reading that because you're boasting about our training programs, right? You can look and find all the reviews you want about our courses online. And a lot of them are that way. A lot of them are transformational. They're catalytic because of the way we treat people. And I'm saying that because if you're a fucking firearms instructor out there, if you are a person of influence, if you're a person that is to educate, motivate, inspire, and empower other people, that is your job. It's not to stand up there and say that you're, hey, I've done this all my life, and now you're going to listen to my two cents. You better keep up. Let's go. Score you on the range. Going to vet you. you know, why would you do that to a, a, a guy or a gal that's you know, not a military guy, not a law enforcement guy? They just want to defend themselves in their homes in the middle of the night, and you're trying to treat them like they're in buds or SFQ course or something. It's like that's not the time for that, uh, and I see a lot of that. Now, I also realize at the same time, point that a lot of people get pissed off like a lot of instructors a lot of you know characters in the industry go well screw those people if they don't want to take it serious if they don't want to be the professional soldier then i don't need them okay dude you gotta <laughs> look i know when bad shit happens i know what i'm going to be capable of because i've i've been there um 
and I've seen beyond. And I try to make sure that I'm always prepared for the worst case scenario because I don't want to let anybody down like I have in my life. Um, everybody, no matter how trained you are, you will let somebody down. I promise you that. You will fuck up royally. You will break down. And that's sometimes the best way to break through is to understand those situations. Um, so I think a lot of people get frustrated when they see somebody not performing well on the range because that instructor wants good shooters on their line, right? You know, and you'll hear that term used in the industry a lot. Shooter. Shooter. You know, are you ready? Shooter, are you ready? Well, in competitive sports, that's your, your shooting. You're a shooter right at that point in time. But the military has a different meaning of the word shooter. Um, you know, when we say precision shooter, we're not talking about a sniper. We're talking about a guy that's, you know, a hostage rescue. You can go into a crowd of a school with hundreds of kids and zip a guy across the parking lot through people above their heads in, in a precision capacity under the worst chaotic stress you can possibly imagine. Worst case scenario. That's what a shooter is, right? That's when everything is going horribly, terribly wrong around you, and it's just another ordinary problem to deal with. That's the hard part about shooting. So when people aren't focusing correctly, they're having problems, paying attention, they're not in the right place on the line when they should be, a lot of instructors I see get pissed off and get arrogant and get condescending, and they'll start talking shit to the student. They'll start um, um, saying things that we don't say, right? <laughs> um I mean, we've, we were looking at a meme this morning of an instructor, a very well-renowned instructor in the industry, putting out a meme talking shit about people. Dude, you need to check your fucking self. Because the last time I checked, we're all in the same boat and we only got one. So I get, I get passionate about this. I'm not going to go on a tangent here, but people need to stop focusing on numbers. They need to start focusing on people, right? Stop focusing on guns and gear. Start focusing on people. How about you gun magazine guys out there? Love you all, need you all, but start focusing on people. Put people on the front of your covers of your magazine. Stop putting fucking guns and gear on it because that's what people will then focus on. And to me, that's misinformation, right? You're creating a stimulus of focus to create spending in the industry. Buy my gear, buy my gear. That's all you see on the front. I don't fucking care if you buy my gear. I care if you understand why we designed the gear for you. And if you understand the principle behind it and you use it because it helps you in your life, man, whew, that feels good. Just like reading that letter. That means that we help somebody in their life. Um, you know, it's like, it, it, you don't care about how many students you teach you. I see websites out there that have have taught over 100,000 students from the United States Air Force, United States Marine Corps, Department of Defense, Homeland Security, State, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, okay, how long did it take you to type that? <laughs> and how how then do you develop relevance with the everyday responsible armed citizen that doesn't have a team that he's going to be entering the door with All right. or she's going to be entering the door with and they're not going to – you know, have... There's an allure there, though, right? When you there, have that special operations kind of instructor stand in front of you, you go, wow. And we want to... Because I was like that as a young take kid. that information. I mean, all of your experience, it's invaluable for people to learn from. Um, people that are literally every day out in our communities protecting us and law enforcement, their experience is invaluable. It's huge. But how can you bridge the gap between those two worlds and the world of educating people and creating relevance in their own life. I think that's, that's one thing that is sometimes missing. And that's one of our goals is, is bridging that gap. And when we look at all the gaps within the industry, um, I, I don't want us to ever come off as being judgmental because I think that what we need to do is build our community. We need to, we need to be, we need to sit around this table with people from the industry and and have a discussion about theories and gear and draws and and how we can perform increased performance in ourselves and in the people that we share this information with. But why is there so much resistance to that? Is it ego? I know we're we're going down a different rabbit no, hole here, but is it is it it ego? is a part of what we're talking about here? And I think you're going to see that with other guests that we have on, and we ask these questions to them. Um, yeah, ego, ego does, does play a big role. Um, and it's either because you're, you're not there yet, right? It's not your time to understand it in a different capacity. Um, you're still living off your military credentials or law enforcement credentials or shooting instructor credentials or your grandmaster this and grandmaster that look, and I've done it all. And, and it's like, none of that matters 
because nobody cares about any of those things until they know about how much you care. And I think that's, we come back full circle here. We go into our course introductions and we go into our intentions. We go into our, um, you know, <laughs> group therapy or tactical self-help with Travis Haley's that people call it sometimes, which is a joke, but it's, it, there's a lot of self-improvement in mind architecture in our classes that create this catalyst of, of asking why of curiosity of, of, bringing out these co- topics of these principles of compassion and vulnerability of, 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 of thousands of years of warrior studies and, and culture that we've, we know it's, they didn't exist. Um, and people are, I don't know why people are so put off by it or when they hear science, like, cause we use a lot of scientific principles in our courses. So if you want to test something that is subjective, like, Oh, I don't like the way you draw your gun. It's not, not fast enough. Like the guys are upstairs arguing about the scoop, the scoop draw. It's like, well, Competitors use a scoop draw because it's faster. the lift. It's like, no, it's not. Um, well, what, what, what do you mean, no, it's not? That's subjective. No, you're subjective because you said it was faster. I said, it was, no, it wasn't. So guess what? We're both wrong until we do what? We go study it. We prove it. We quantify it. That's right. And, and then you can't argue with science. It's a great thing about it. Yep. You just trust the science, right? And then we add variables. But and it's got to be repeatable. To, that's right. And so, and then it has to be repeatable in all those different scenarios, which okay, maybe the scoop draw versus a standard type of draw that we would teach is two different things, but one might be necessary in this type of variable that's on you. We don't know that that is until we say it. It's just like back in the old days where, well, shit, still today, people argue about muzzle down or muzzle up. It's like, well, what should, which one should we do? Well, don't do muzzle up because that's what the Navy SEALs do. Oh, that's, that was the argument back when I was in. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then anytime a SEAL will come up behind us in the stack – with a muzzle up, you know, we'd have this can saying, it's like, hey man, until neurosurgery becomes as cheap as orthopedic surgery, keep your fucking muzzle down. And they're like, whatever, dude. And we would always laugh about it and bust each other's balls about it. And we were never allowed to go muzzle up and they were never allowed to go muzzle down. It was like this weird thing at this this certain point in era. Until what? Until we started testing and putting other um, environments into it and sharing information and opening and up dis- and being vulnerable, vulnerable. <laughs> and saying, and discussing things. Guys, why do you really keep your muzzle up? Uh, well, because of this, 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 and this. Why do you guys always keep your muzzle down? Well, because of this, 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 and this. Why don't we try all f- five or 10 of those scenarios and environments and test it, throw some variables on it, see what happens. And then we started realizing, well, if I'm tucked in behind a vehicle, I definitely might want to keep my muzzle up. But why? Right? Because there's times I'll keep a muzzle down. Well, somebody's shooting at me from a two-story apartment complex. Probably going to keep a muzzle up so I can come up and pop over and be ready, right? And be tucked into that vehicle. Um, so I'm like, hmm, well, okay, there's a check in the box. I might want to keep that in my bag of tricks, you know? Why else? Um, well, if I'm moving and manipulating the gun. All right, we test that. Throw some variables on it. All right, that, fuck, that works pretty good too. Um, and then you keep going down this list until you realize, like, wow, we're, we're both right. We both have great reasons for doing both of these things but why are we always arguing and why doesn't that happen today what 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 are the dangers of social media i mean so much information is out there that we can pick up and and learn from immediately and why is there so much infighting and maybe infighting is not the why is there so much debate why is there so many people saying well you do it wrong and you do it wrong and this is the way I think the biggest reason why is a concept that I've heard Brene Brown talk about, and that's common enemy intimacy. Um, for example, this this meme that um, of this guy that put out this this thing this morning, and this memes every day from everybody, right? Uh, I've even been guilty of it. But when you start talking trash about other people in our industry that are literally trying to help other people, whether you agree with them or not, it's just kind of like it's like race or polit- political or sexual preference. It's like why, why are you? Why are you into my shit so much, man? Because you have no idea what that other person's actually helping. You have no idea what that other person's going through in their own life. And so obviously that shows a lack of compassion, shows a lack of his own vulnerability. Because I guarantee that person won't open up about their own self because all they know how to do is bash others. They're not putting the rules of or the four agreements into play, which the four agreements are be impeccable with your words. Hint, hint, for all you making memes out there, right? <laughs> Unless they're really funny. I like I like funny memes. Never take anything personal. Don't ever make assumptions and climb the ladder of excellence. Keep being excellent every single day. If everybody for one fucking day did those four things, this world would be a completely different place. It'd be boring. We'd have no job security. We'd be nobody to kill. 
right? But maybe that's the world we all want. That's the peace that we all strive for. That's why we carry guns every day is to try to have that ultimate peace of never having to use the gun. That's a true thinker before a shooter. But the common enemy intimacy aspect is what you see wrong with, I think, a majority of the world. Um, hey, if you're going to talk shit about Catholics, come over here and do it with me. If you're going to talk shit about Christians, you're talking shit about Republicans, you're talking shit about gays or transsexuals or straight people or whatever, do it next to me. Oh, you, you don't like Black Lives Matter? Yeah, then come over here and do it next to me. Like, yeah, I could throw out any example. Oh, you don't like the, the Dallas Cowboys? Yeah, fuck them. I don't either. Come do it next to me. You have nothing in common with this other person. Outside of hatred. Ex for that thing, yeah. that person, that that object, that um, distinction that you don't like, right? And that's that's the biggest problem is when we create that intimacy and we have no idea why. Like, I remember when people bashing the Scottsdale Mall open when they came here and and, and BLM and Antifa trashed it. There were people that were tourists that were visiting and shit started going down. And they're like, what is going on? Oh, we're throwing rocks through buildings. Cool. I want to fucking do that too. And they had no affiliation with them at all. And they still went out there and started just doing bad things because kids and, you know, and that, and those people would, would at that point go, well, they're doing it. So why can't we do it? Let's get our frustrations out as well. And uh, that was a common enemy intimacy that they created together through an action or words. Um, that's what I don't like about those memes. That's what I don't like about talking shit about people in the industry. Um, now I'll call somebody out. I'll, I'll call the kettle black. And most of the time I'll do it. Um, I'll do it personally. I call the person up literally like back in the olden days. Like my kids said, dad, back in the olden days, did you guys have cords on your phones? Like, wait, what? You better pump the brakes on. So, <laughs> I will call them or message them directly. Like, hey, I just want your video. Um, I'm curious your thoughts on this because, like, Lucas, all right? I'll call him out. Um, everybody's like, what do you think of Lucas? Phenomenal shooter. He is, whether you like it or not. He's He's got great abilities. Um, and he the other day he said, uh, made a video like, hey, shooting is simple and, you, you, you know, be careful going to a lot of classes and spend a lot of money and wasting your time. I, I can understand what he's saying because there are a lot of people out there that are teaching things that, like, I would probably not want to waste my money on and I would want to avoid other people going there. However, shooting is not simple, like we talked about earlier, right? And so I, I hit him up where a lot of other people are like, hey, did you hear what fucking Lucas said, man? He's saying shooting simply trying to take our business away. I'm like, okay, first off, that's not a thing, okay? There's no competition in the training world because if all you trainers out there wanted to train everybody in your neighborhood right now, you would it would take all year for you to do it. We have plenty of people out there that need training. So we need to stop infighting again. We're all in the same boat. And we only have one. Um, so I will immediately reach out and be like, hey, I'm just curious about the concept of simple shooting. Because the last time I was in an actual shooting, it was the most complex moment of my entire life, man. And so I want to make sure that people understand the distinction between what you're saying about shooting is simple and being a shooter, right? Being a tactician, being somebody that has a, a ability to have good judgmental use of force, um, understands law to a point. Um, understands definitely right and wrong, um, has vulnerability, has compassion for mankind, um, and, and can be a good human being, right? Those are hard things to do, right? Shooting is, is simple. So I think we need to do more of that. Whether we agree with those people or not, reach out to them, you know? Um, but, but, but when somebody but do drops it constructively, a fucking, that's right. But do when, it, do it respectfully, right? Because that's the only way. You know, you and I until you drop this. a meme, though, man, I'm not going to reach out to you and say, "Hey, dude, be careful with that." Like, right. you should just know. Be a good man. Be a good man. Be a good woman. Don't, don't do that. How right? much of that is marketing and stirring the pot? A lot of it. A lot of it. Right. Because there's a lot of people that have competition. They think, "Oh my God, he's competing. He's doing. He's doing this now, or that person. Oh, they're doing night vision classes now. Oh, they're doing red dot courses. So I need to, you know, do this. Or they're, you know, science. We're starting to see that pop up, which is, which is awesome. Where it was laughed at ten years ago when we started doing it. Uh, because, again, it creates law, right? That's what we're objectively trying to That's do right. is take this subjective thought process, this theory, and test it, repeat it, and go, you know what? This, this actually works. works. This works. It works for me. For right now. For right now. And that's why we always say science is not to ever be believed. It's to, it's be, to be questioned. questioned. Constantly questioned, which is why we love it. It's not Where what I, the news tells us. And right. I think there's a misunderstanding to that as well. Some people be like, oh, fucking science, big deal, right? Oh, they're just science freaks. Um, it's like, mm, 
No, there's a lot of belief system that goes into what we do. I think a lot of people also that dispel that probably actually in their career field, if they're successful, they employ the same approach. They analyze everything they do. They are, they are employing science. They just don't realize it. Yeah. Anyway, well, I'm looking forward to, to, to doing more of these. I mean, I, I know all the people that we're going to have on board is, is going to help share some light into, uh, you know, these conversations that Jared and I are, are starting to talk about. Um, you know, I think it's, it's kind of the be your own guru concept, you know, explore you, explore what your purpose is in life. Um, if you're not happy, do something different. That's, that's what I always tell people. And, uh, and, and literally, you know, it, man, I, I, I never, sometimes I gotta be careful with it. Like this morning, so, <laughs> sometimes I, uh, well, I mean, all the time I realize I have a job. I don't ever have to work a day in my life because I love it so much. I love coming here and being creative. I love um, sharing knowledge. I love creating new programs or product development and just giving back to the community that I, I wanted to for so long. And I finally have the ability to do that. Um, so you'll hear that from a lot of the, the people that are coming on board. To that point, <clears throat> one thing that I think we want to do with this is is kind of close each podcast with a question. Mm. One that will be passed along to, to future guests. But you talked about creativity and, and not really going to work a day in your life. You're ambitious, you're driven, you're creative, you're always on the move. And if you reflect on even the last 10, 12 years, even, even, since, you've in, even since the inception of Haley Strategic Partners, or you can even go back further throughout your military career, with everything that you have accomplished, all of your ambition, what have you sacrificed? You're asking me this right now? Or you, yeah. Is that that's the question you're going to ask that's guests in the future? Both. Oof. Wait, what have I sacrificed what, in that time? What have you now? I know that this, this may take some <laughs> exploration. You and I have done a lot of reflecting on a path forward, but, and you can even think about what that's going to take, but in your career, what have you given up to be who you are, to find that purpose, to peel away all those layers, to get down to what you stated you feel like your purpose is right now? How much sacrifice has that taken? Well, that was a that was an interesting question. I've never, I've, I've never really um, been asked that. And I always say, you know, fearlessly be vulnerable and you know share it throughout emotion, regardless of how much it, it creates. And I'm really struggling. Because I think the first thing that comes to my mind is a thing that you typically don't think about a whole lot when you're in the fight, when you're in the arena, and that's your kids, that's your family. Um, you know, you hear a lot of people... You got me with that one. You hear a lot of people say... Um, <clears throat> you know, I got to be the best example for my kids and my family. So, you know, and, and be the best for yourself. Um, and, and there's a lot of, a lot of sacrifice for that. A lot of guys out there in the military and law enforcement and first responders. I mean, my dad, my dad was in power company for 44 years, you know, and I never saw him. Um, and I, and when I did, it was quality time with dad. It really was. Were you proud of that? Were you proud of him for doing that? Yeah, I was. And I think that was mom. Mom was really great with that because she edified, right? And that's something I think we also lack in this world as well is 
the edification, especially if you come from a broken family, right? That's a tough one with alienation. Like I'm, I'm unfortunately in that situation after getting a divorce and you know, after 18 years of, of, of marriage and, and two wonderful children. Um, and, uh, with, with her and then Travis Jr. Of course, my, my oldest boy, you know, it's been tough. It's been, and so I guess that answers some of the question, you know, I, I, uh, young and dumb and I'm on the road. I got, you know, hitched very, very early in life, um, to Travis's, to Travis's mom. And, and of course that was during the, the beginning of reconnaissance training and going through all the schools and, and setting my path as a recon Marine. Um, and of course that ended up in a quick split. Like that wasn't even really a marriage. Um, and then I spent the next 12 years of Travis Jr.'s life being away. Um, whether it was on the other side of the country or whether it was on the other side of the world to the point where I even came home one time. And, you know, I've said this before on video that, you know, I, I walk in the door and I said, Hey buddy, I'm home. And he turns around and looks at me and looks at mom, looks back at me, looks back at mom and says, mom, who's that? And I was like, Holy shit. And I know there's a lot of guys out there that feel that. Um, and I, and I don't want them to be ashamed of that. I don't want them to regret that. And that's the balance I think is the difficult part of this, this question, you know, I, I can't say that I regret that, but I lost my son um, for a long time. Um, he's 23 now, and it wasn't until what last year when you were there when I rebuilt that relationship with him. Um, and we've had a relationship, but it hasn't been the one I want. What you want, right. And more importantly, it hasn't been the one he's wanted. And so that was a sacrifice. And uh, so I, I try to make up those times now as much as I can. You know, a divorce, probably a part of it. Um, you know, losing a lot, losing, sacrifice money, time, parts of myself. Um, you know, of course, that's, that's always the first thing that will haunt you the rest of your life is how much you've traumatized your own self, your own brain from... You know, whether it's post-traumatic type stuff of certain events of your life that you can't shake and then you, you eventually figure out how and then something else pops up or, you you know, traumatic brain injuries from, you know, helicopter crashes and skydiving accidents and you name it, and MMA and, and all that stuff. All these guys out there that, that deal with these, these things, they are sacrificing every single day. And I don't want people to ever stop doing that. We need people to, to step up and to... Um, be savagely compassionate, and yeah, you have to you have to be willing to give something up in order to take on something new. And sometimes when we're young, we don't realize that you you might even have to sacrifice your own family, you know. And and I think military people that, um, you know, unlike law enforcement, okay, you're going to go out for the evening, you're going to go out for the day, you may go out for a week and come back. Uh, we're military, you're not going to see your family for six, seven, eight months, maybe a year or more. That alone is a huge sacrifice because that's it's a it's a sacrifice to you like hey the greater good is putting me overseas to fight this this war on terror or whatever to to make the world a better place than what we all came in it and so that's okay you know it's okay to sacrifice time away from my family because that's the manly thing to do that's the protector that's what we've always done for thousands and thousands of years of, of that we can look back as men stood up grabbed their shields and swords and went off to combat and their wives and families said come back with your shield or on it um, that's the way it always was today. It's a little different, you know, today I come home, you know, which I, one time I was home within a gunfight after Iraq and contracting, I was home 48 hours after a pretty, pretty decent gunfight, um, walking in to hug my kids. And that's like, that's, you're still shaking. You know, you're not, you're not fit. You're not like, Oh my God, I was in fucking war. Like, no, I'm like amped up, man. I want to go back in it. I'm, I'm still there. And, but I'm still, I'm trying to trying to compensate with this child this thing now that's unfamiliar to me and then i realize holy shit that's my son that's i I, i've i I feel now that there's a a, an abandonment almost that you 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 create and that abandonment is a sacrifice that we we tend to make to you know make this world a greater place um and i think that sacrifice always has to be made it does um, and then going back to your question, I think is what bothered me so badly in the beginning of this is that, and, and thank you for asking, did you like resent your father or did you, did it bother you that he was gone so much? No, because 
mom did a good job of edifying and saying, dad's out helping people right now. What do you mean he's out helping people? Like, you won't see your dad for two weeks with this hurricane right now. Like, why? Wait, see how is he okay? Dad's always okay. Dad always comes home. Dad was that guy. He was the most, like, implementive, savage dude on the power force, man. And uh, he'd be out there in 90 mile per hour winds, hanging off a telephone pole with lightning. He got hit by lightning three times. And, and, uh, one time, busted him off a 33-foot pole, sm- collapsed the roof of his truck, gets in, pushes the roof of the truck up with his back, hammers it, and then drives himself to the hospital. Uh, that's the kind of shit that I grew up on, you know? Um, so I, I always do that. Like, if I look at what my... Like, how many people have we helped in our lives? A lot. We have. You know, it's clear right there. Um if I look back to my father, every time a storm would come through and millions of people would be out of power, he's the guy. He's the one who got them back on power, saving people's lives because it's 120 degrees in the summertime and raining in Florida. It's it's a swamp, man. Um, so I realized that that was a huge sacrifice that he made, and he did it for all of us, right? And so I think that's where you can take that mentality on. I'm like, well, if I go out overseas and I do those things and I'm away from my kids, then they'll, they'll know that I'm out there doing the right thing for people and they'll be proud of me. So I think the question that you, you had was, do you resent your father? And I, I go, I wasn't worried about answering that question. You know what answer I was trying to worry about? I was like, what do my kids think of me? Right. Do my kids realize that I had good intentions to help people? And I know my boys do now. Travis Jr. may not. You know, um, he does, but he didn't feel it. You know, and I and I, I want to give that back to him. So yeah, my kids, my um, like people have said in the past, like, hey man, don't thank me for my service. Thank my wife. Thank my kids. You know, thank them for for putting up with my shit for so many years. For baby, basically every time I would get on a boat, get on a plane, go overseas, I was perpetrating in some way, shape, or form, to somebody. Somebody hated the fact that I had to leave them. Um, but I had this greater, you know, reason or higher power would say, you got to you know, do this thing. Um, so all those become sacrifices in the moment you don't care about. But when you reflect back on your life, as you get older, as we're doing right now, you start to realize, holy shit, how... How did I really truly affect other people in what I thought was going to be a positive way because people would understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. And then all of a sudden I realized, like, how is an eight-year-old kid supposed to understand what I'm doing? You know, how's my my wife at the time who doesn't know anything about that world supposed to understand the fact that I need to just leave every time I can to go overseas to fight bad things? Um, those are Those are big. Those are big sacrifices. All they see is time lost. And that's a perpetration. And I think if, and, and one thing that I've realized through a, a leadership and, and self mind architecture school that I went to last year, um, one of the biggest things we talked about in the beginning was perpetrations and withholds, right? So if you perpetrate on somebody, and it could be anything, it could be you left, you know, you went away for eight months and then your family's like, well, dad, you always leave and you're never here. Um, or you never come to my games, you know, you never do this, you never do that. And, and a lot of times you don't realize that, you know, like we were talking to Trevor earlier about this. He said, yeah, my dad was never in my games. And I realized after I, I grew up a little bit and realized, holy shit, he was working his ass off every day, all day and all night so I could be a wrestler, so I could get a scholarship, so I could be a top wrestler at Purdue, so I could be that Division One athlete, so I can be a kinesiologist, so I can be what I am today at Haley Strategic. Like He realizes that. That's the person he became because his dad allowed him to be But for how many years did he think his dad perpetrated against him every single day, right? I think that's what my brain did when you first asked me that question. Like, what have you sacrificed? I'm like, and it wasn't necessarily what have I sacrificed? It's like, how have I hurt people? Yeah. How have I hurt people, man? Because you you do. And, and, you know, a lot of people congratulate us on our success. And it's like, what's his name? I forget that. The rich guy, the money guy. He's like, people congratulate me on success. It's like being pregnant. (laughs) They say, everybody says congratulations for being pregnant, but nobody knows how many times you had to get fucked. You know, like it's, it makes sense. It's, it's freaking okay. I get it, man. Yeah. I've been, I've been burnt. I've been broken down. I've hit rock bottom. I've, 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 you know, I've, I've been scraping the edges, man. And like, holy shit. 
um, and I've come back from it. Now, I'm okay with that, but I'm not okay with putting that on my kids or my, my family. And so in today's world, I try to balance that a lot better. And so I won't withhold that like I did for so many years as an example with my oldest boy when, you know, Bertoni said, why are you withholding? I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, you, you have perpetrated against your own son. And I'm like, he got in a little bit of trouble at one point in time. And then I was like, you know what, if you're going to do that, just do, you know, like we, you got to, you got, you're dealing with situations yeah. too, yeah. teenagers. And uh, it's like, you want to do that? Then fine, go do it and watch what happens. Well, that's a good thing to do is to allow somebody to do something dangerous carefully. Like that, GP that, says, that's, but a, that's a really hard thing to do because all we want is, is to try to protect them and shield them for years. And then finally resisting, finally they have to, they have to go do it. And all they need is, all they need is this. When she said, get your ass on a plane right now and go there. And we did. We all went to Pennsylvania. And uh, I drove up to his house. And I hadn't seen him in, what, four years? It was since the last time we had problems or whatever. And I walked up, and he saw me. No communication, no phone calls, no nothing. He saw me, and I thought he was going to punch me. <laughs> and said he dove at me and hugged me. And, dude, I swear that kid who's not a kid anymore, 23 years old, 230 pounds, six foot three, six foot four you know, hugged me for, it swear to God, it was 10 minutes. And he let go of me and looked at me and he grabbed my head and said, dad, this is all I needed. And I was like, holy shit. Why have I perpetrated and withheld for so long from my own child? That's a sacrifice, right? Not one anybody wants to make. So I guess if, if anything that I'm saying here resonates with people out there that are in those types of situations, if you have to sacrifice for the greater good, do it, right? If you have to help yourself, your family, humanity, mankind, do it. Um, but if you are perpetrating on somebody and withholding, which is easy to do while you're out there trying to save your complex, save the world, help people, et cetera, don't forget that to check in with that and go, wait, am I, am I actually withholding against somebody right now that really, truly just needs this, needs that, that presence, that love? Um, and that instantly told me everything's going to be okay. And now we have that relationship back. And now we can talk. Now we can just go fishing and not say a damn thing. You know, um, that's cool. Uh, I, re I remember the peace on your face when you walked back in the door there in Pennsylvania that night. And you sat down and you just smiled. Yeah. You were, you were almost giddy. It's huge to let go of that. Yeah. That stress, man. Um, yeah. That, wow. That was, uh, so that's the question we're going to ask. <sighs> that's the question we're going to ask. I wish I had time to work on that one. Um, sacrifice is, is necessary. It's not just okay. It's, it's necessary, but at the same time, it's, you have to balance it. And I would, I would say to anybody out there that's young and going crazy and trying to smash themselves in their, in their 20s, which I think is a very good thing to do, like I said earlier, to find your limitations, um, do it quick. So that way when you're in your 30s and 40s you're trying to settle down with a family, you're not trying to do that. Um, and you're not trying to find yourself. Now, some of us have to. Some of us got to start over in our 40s, 50s, and 60s, and that's fine. Um, and you may have to do it more than once. Oh, yeah. Be, I, mean, I certainly have. Well, think about, think about in, in people's – reflection how many times do we hear uh, i'll say men because the majority of our our students are men now we're working to change that but uh, how many times do we hear men reflect on their their sacrifice and their time not as much it, as we should no but it happens but, but in our classes in our happens. classes the proof right there proof in every after action that we get um, I invite people to share more of that. Yeah. I invite people to share fearlessly, you know, and be vulnerable. Regardless of how many tears come out of your eyes, that's what makes you a fucking man, right? That is the difference between divine masculine and divine feminine, the Shakti Shiva concepts. If you, again, study culture, study warrior history, you've got to be in touch with that. Study yourself. You study yourself study first. Yourself. It'll tell you everything. Yeah. Yourself will tell you everything. And that's the hardest thing in the world to do is is be introspective and be truthful with yourself yeah and if you're lucky you've got somebody that'll help you do that in your life yeah 
Well, that's good, man. Thank yeah. You. Thanks for uh, for pushing me. I appreciate that. We, we came we came a long way today. We um, I, don't know, I can't even retrace our steps. What do you want to What do you want to end this with? Because we're about that time. In that next room, underneath that conference table is a train. And we're we're obviously out on the road a lot. Um, we're away. We're on the on the training train. Share a, a little bit about why you chose that. Why you chose that locomotive in there underneath that that conference table? Yeah, I think that goes with what we're we're talking about today. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a. I had uh, the guys over at Yamwood. If you haven't seen Yamwood stuff, check them out at uh, at Yamwood dot com. It's it's one of Bob Parsons' companies that they do the most wicked furniture in in the world, in my opinion. Um, Oh, we need to put some more pictures and stuff up because it is incredible. But we we made this like I don't know, it's like twenty five hundred pounds or something, um, train conference table that uh, is like this modernistic looking train with wheels and the whole thing moves with like one finger. It's how precision machines the wheels are. Um, but why a train? Um, <coughs> and then why the fixture that's above the train table, which is a um, a, a very large chandelier Shovel. with two two nine foot long shovels on it and these pieces of coal are about as big as bowling balls, you know, different sizes and um, about that range. And, and there's fire and sparks going all through it. And these shovels are shoveling the coal in the ceiling. And then the ceiling is all smoke, like black puffy insulated smoke look. And that is a reminder for me and everybody here that I wanted to share that story with that that train we the train here right from a, like even a traction assessment if you're if you understand traction assessments in business um you need to make sure that you have the right people on the train and you need to make sure you have the right people on the right seats on the train so we we of course go the extra mile here to do that and where i came up with this this old concept i'll share a, a kind of a, a movie story with you so if you can uh and this is, this is my past history story that a lot of people say, well, why did you do what you did for so long? And then you made this, this great revolutionary, you know, impact on the industry and then you just left and then started Haley Strategic and all this other stuff. So I'm like, well, it's simple, man. It's, it's where does your train want to go at that point in time? And um, if you could insert yourself into a Wild Wild West movie for a second and you see, you know, the quiet town and all of a sudden the train starts coming. You see the smoke pumping out, right? It's moving down the tracks. What do typically people do in the movie when the train's coming? Run to the train. Because it hasn't. See what the train is bringing to town. That's right. Because it doesn't come very often. But when it does, it brings people you've never met, people you haven't seen in a long time, entertainment, supplies, medical, whatever, right? It has impact. It has a huge impact on that town. But the town has an even, I think, bigger impact on the train. Because we're figuring out what that town truly needs. So the next time we stop there, we can we can do it even better, right? And then the, everybody thrives from each other. Train, pack, train packs up, heads down the tracks to the next town. Well, I think what happens is when you you start creating a, a reputation, a brand, you know, you get in the limelight a little bit, um, people have high expectations of you. And so when you get those those higher expectations, which I don't like, because that's why we changed that word to in, intentions versus expectations. Um, your principles can become ab abandoned pretty quickly. So when you start creating notoriety, a reputation, a big brand, people get really excited when that train comes to town. But the problem is the train's got to make a balance, right? It's got to make a decision. It starts picking up speed, and then it has to determine whether it's efficient or not for that faster now moving train, bigger moving train to stop at that small, tiny town. Because when you look out the window as the engineer of that train with your partners and go, hey, does this town have anything to offer us? Nah, man, keep going. Keep going. Let's go find a bigger city. Let's go find a port city. Let's go international, right? To me, that was a cool adventure to be on because you're – making big to stay big. You're making millions and millions and millions of dollars, seven figure POs coming in every single day. There's hundreds of people growing every day in your organization. You're employing probably a thousand people in the whole state with different manufacturers and subcontractors. Um, and you're feeling good. You're making an impact, but you don't feel good because you realize you just abandoned your core. And that's what I realized in that moment. 
And I said, wait, 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 guys, I think we need to pump the brakes here because we're flying through towns and the people that made us this great train are going, hey, whoa, what about us? Why are you, why, why aren't you stopping? And I said, this doesn't feel right, man. I feel sick to my stomach and we need to stop this train. Otherwise we're going to go off the cliff. You know, we're going to go off that, like the, the classic movie scene with the bridge has got a hole in it. Back to the future. You're just riding on the train. You don't even know because you're having fun. Um, yeah. Uh, back to future, man. It's like, I saw that hole coming. I was like, I'm not, that's not where I want to be right now. It's anybody's prerogative to do anything they want with their business. It's America. We need to remember that. Right. Um, Anybody can do whatever they want here. That's what we need to remember. So, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to go back and help those towns. I really did because I think that's the core. And and what I realized, we abandoned the core. So I started realizing some other issues and I I said, you know what? I'm going to get back to it. I'm going to get back to my core. I'm going to make a massive leap right now because the train's not stopping at this point. I was hoping it would stop at a town I could get off and maybe go, you know, find a new life. Instead, I jumped and I jumped at probably 200 miles per hour and I hit the ground and I flew down the hill like in some crazy movie scene again. And I'm dirty, dusty and shit's flying everywhere, picking up my six shooters and my hat and knocking off the dust. I'm all scraped up and beat to hell. And now I'm in the middle of the desert. Now I'm walking, looking back, going, how the fuck do I reintroduce myself into the industry after that? And I realized the best thing to do just like this podcast was to not start another train, but to build a train station so we can help as many people as we want, as many companies as we want. We can stop at every damn town. That's why the training team's growing. Um, it's not, it's just not about me. This is, this is, we have a legacy here, man. We've, uh, we have so many great things that all of us do together. I'm so proud of this team. Um, for, for helping as many people as we help and continually growing that mission um, to stop at every single town. That's why it's in there. It's to remind every single person, that coal and that fire that's above that table, it is to remind you to stop feeding this train or don't ever feed this train with money and greed. You feed it with heart and soul or heart and coal, right? And when you do that, you will know, I will guarantee you, that if you focus on your core, don't abandon it, Put people first. Share impeccably. Again, don't make assumptions. Don't take shit personally and climb the ladder of excellence and keep that train moving from town to town and helping every certain per- every person that you can, that you can be certain about. I'll guarantee you'll make this world a better place than what you came in. So that's the reminder for us here. The story, the culture of this company is built on failure. You know, we've got the flag from Iwo Jima in there on the wall, the, the command tent flag. And that's a reminder of sacrifice. That's a reminder of, of like, you just asked me, what did, what did they sacrifice? Everything, right? The greatest generation in the world sacrificed a lot. And we are still to this day sacrificing. Um, and I want to be okay with that. No matter if I left the world right now, I'd be happy. And if you can't say that, Find it. Something's got to change. Something's got to change. That's right. Well, you guys out there listening, when you see Halo Strategic Partners, there's meaning in the word partners. That's that's how we see the industry. That's how we see the world because we want to help. We want to help everybody. Want to bridge the gap. And when you see Halo Strategic Train, keep that locomotive in mind Mm -hmm. because that's our goal. We're trying to stop as many places as as we can. And, and it's tough. You know, we're, we're trying to find more days in, in every calendar year. We want to get to, we want to reach as, as many people as we possibly can. And, uh, you know, we're, we're working hard to make that happen all the time. We've got a tremendous team that we're, we're building and, and we just want to be out there on the road. But Yeah, and not just in the shooting space or the thinking space. You know, if there's other ideas you guys want to hear from us on the podcast, for example, this is the bridge, right? So we're we're able to bridge any gap we want to here. Well, we may not be able to do it from a training standpoint because we may not know that specific world, but it doesn't mean we can't have somebody sitting here in that world to explain to us how they do things. And I think you're going to find a lot of crossover, a lot of, a lot of, um, like I, like we mentioned earlier, you know, putting, putting your life into your shooting. I started realizing, man, if I, 
if I do my chores differently at home, if I do my, if I practice efficiency and be deliberate at it during those things that I hate doing, is that going to carry over to some type of procedural memory of efficiency in everything that I do? I, I believe yes is the answer to that. And I think a lot of neuroscientists will say yes to that as well. Um, so that's what you'll see. And uh, you'll see people hopefully being vulnerable, especially I hope they're more than me on that question. Um, no, I want to learn. I want to learn what other people's sacrifices are. I think that's a good time to do that. Um, we talk about guns and gear all day long, every day. We love that stuff, but it's not about guns and gear. It's about people. And that's what the bridge is about. And that's what we're going to bring you guys. Jared, thanks, buddy. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us today, guys. Can't wait to do it again. See you on the next time. We'll be right back.